Sadly, the space agency that discovered this is also one of the US's partners. There's growing pressure to ground the shuttles early, but that would create another problem. Without them, there would be no way of delivering parts needed to build the International Space Station. The shuttle is the only spacecraft big enough to carry these parts scheduled for delivery over the next four years. Without them, the station would not fulfill its scientific promise and NASA would not fulfill its promises to international partners. They are not going to blow the whistle on NASA when they rely on them to lift their payloads into space. So it should come as no surprise why ESA is very quiet on Smart One's discovery. What's that I hear you say? But these different rocks that Easter analyzed came from below ground. Maybe that's why they are different to the Apollo samples. Well, if I may remind you, it wasn't just surface material that the astronauts supposedly collected. On the later missions, drilling equipment was used to gather samples below ground. And some of these landings took place in very deep regions. The Apollo 17 mission, for example, took place at Taurus Lithro, a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon. And on Apollo 15, the astronauts specifically gathered samples ejected from deep craters. As we are told on the Lunar and Planetary Institute's website, Station 1 was located on the east flank of Elbow Crater. Here, the astronauts performed radial sampling, collecting samples at various distances from the crater, corresponding to material ejected from different depths below the surface when the crater formed. Also, on the same mission, during the second EVA, David Scott collected rock, dust and core samples from the bottom of a 12 meter crater. This is even deeper than how far the Smart One penetrated. As we are told on Wikipedia, Scott decided to move down to a 40 foot crater, which was the largest one nearby. He went down inside it to sample, but found most of the rocks to be too large. Mission Control called up and said they would like the crew to dig a trench to study the soil mechanics and to take a core sample. Irwin dug the trench, which Scott photographed. Then the core sample was taken from inside the crater. With this in mind, it can be confidently stated that the actual moon rocks are different to the Apollo samples collected above and below ground. By punching a 10 metre hole in the moon's surface, the probe has uncovered minerals different to the rocks gathered on the surface during moonwalks. Knowing that the Apollo rocks are different to those analysed by Smart One, what proof do we have that men actually went there? On Apollos 11, 14 and 15, the astronauts set up a number of experiments. One of which was called the Lunar Laser Ranger Experiment. It consisted of arranging a series of corner reflectors on the lunar surface to allow observatories to fire a laser at the moon which would then bounce back to Earth. On Wikipedia's page regarding this experiment, we are told the undeniable presence of the reflectors on the moon's surface has been used to refute claims that the Apollo landings were faked. However, the Soviets performed this experiment too, without sending people up there. The Russian Lunokhod 2 rover carried a retro reflector of its own to the moon. Interestingly, for some time, Encyclopedia Astronautica had this to say about Lunokhod 2. The Lunokhod was not left in a position such that a later retro reflector could be used, indicating that the failure may have happened suddenly. And yet, on the Zigzag Productions documentary, Jerry Wyant of the McDonald Observatory told us, and of course, at Apollo 11 site is where 
uh, the United States placed its first lunar retro package. So we, we fire laser at this spot and two others, uh, three others on the moon. We fire laser at this spot and two others, uh, three others on the moon. And two others, uh, three others on the moon. Three others on the moon. As you know, the Americans only placed three. The odd one out was left by the Russians. We fire laser at this spot and two others, uh, three others on the moon. Wyatt's statement not only contradicts the claim that Russia failed to get a working retro reflector to the moon, but also the claim that you couldn't do this with an unmanned craft. Of course, it has become apparent that an unmanned probe wouldn't have been needed to bounce lasers off the moon. Nor would you need a manned craft for that matter. The good old folks from MoonMovie.com were kind enough to point me in the direction of the December 1966 issue of National Geographic. In this issue, one comes across an article entitled The Laser's Bright Magic, written by Thomas Malloy. On page 876, Molloy states, Four years ago, a ruby laser considerably smaller than those now available shot a series of pulses at the moon, 240,000 miles away. The beams illuminated a spot less than two miles in diameter and were reflected back to Earth with enough strength to be measured by ultra-sensitive electronic equipment. The Apollo 11 crew placed the first lunar reflector in 1969. And yet, the first lasers were bounced off the moon in 1962, a good seven years before the first moon landing. This is documented in the National Geographic, and yet, they sold this lemon to the world when they chose to air their revised version of the Zigzag Productions documentary. Now he's turned the laser on. In a few seconds, you'll see the, the splash. The laser hits the reflector on the moon's surface and bounces back as a series of pulses invisible to the human eye. By measuring the time it takes for each laser pulse to return, scientists gather key information about the Earth's position in the solar system. That's not light coming from the moon. The splash you see is, is light coming from uh, the end of our own telescope. That's the first spot where a man walked on the moon. Our search for the truth has revealed the definitive answer. Maybe that's why conspiracy theorists have so little to say on this subject. The New York Times also carried an article about bouncing lasers off the moon, long predating Apollo 11. In the November 5th, 1963 printing, we find a tiny article entitled, Soviet Bounces Light Beam Off Moon in a Laser Test. A concentrated beam of light has been bounced off the moon and detected on Earth by a Soviet observatory in Crimea. The feat, reported today by TAS, the Soviet press agency, duplicates an experiment conducted late last year by engineers of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The superintensive beam was produced by a laser, a device that amplifies and focuses light. The principle is believed to have potential use in space communications and long distance energy transmission. The Soviet announcement said that a laser had been installed at the focal point of the 100-inch reflector telescope at the Crimean Astrophysical Observatory. Understandably, not a single propagandist from any pro-NASA website makes any mention of this documented fact. Instead, they all insist that, quote, If there was nothing at that point but rock, that would be the last you would see of your laser.